Welcome to the Right to Reason podcast. I am your host, Robert Stanley. Today, Hector A. Garcia will explain why we go to war. It's the Right to Reason podcast. <laughs> Deadliest place on earth, the Korngal Valley. We're not ready for this. I'm thinking, what are we doing? I joined the military right out of high school in 2000. I joined the National Guard first. And then after 9-11 happened, I, I signed up for uh, active duty. As a native veteran, when I went to Iraq, like a lot of those people, like they're, they're similar to natives. I was actually felt more aligned with them than I did with my own people at times because like the same thing that we were doing to those people is the same thing that Americans did to us. For myself, it like left a lot of uh, guilty feelings. Like how could I do this to other people? It's a hard thing too with Standing Rock, you know, why should I have served in the military? A lot of veterans are like, why, native veterans are like, why the hell did we serve when they're going to come and do this to us here? We like war. We're a warlike people. We like war because we're good at it. You know why we're good at it? Because we get a lot of practice. This country's only 200 years old and already we've had 10 major wars. We average a major war every 20 years in this country, so we're good at it. And it's a good thing we are. We're not very good at anything else anymore. Huh? Can't build a decent car. Can't make a TV set or a VCR worth the fuck. Got no steel industry left. Can't educate our young people. Can't get health care to our old people. But we can bomb the shit out of your country, all right? Especially if your country is full of brown people. Oh, we like that, don't we? That's our hobby. That's our new job in the world, bombing brown people. Iraq, Panama, Grenada, Libya, you got some brown people in your country, tell them to watch the fuck out, or we'll goddamn bomb them. Something happened. to the civilian world. I have no idea. <laughs> I still obviously haven't figured out how to deal with it inside. The only hope I have right now is that eventually I'll be able to process it differently. I'm never going to forget it. I don't want to not have that as a memory because that was one of the moments that makes me appreciate everything that I have. This episode of the Right to Reason podcast is brought to you by our patrons and contributors like me. We have all recognized the value of the unrestrained marketplace of ideas and have decided to make a difference. You can make a difference too. Contribute at patreon.com forward slash right and learn more about your right to reason at the right to reason.com. Your activism is appreciated. Dr. Hector A. Garcia, I am so happy to have you back, sir. Robert, man, it's uh, always fun to talk with you, buddy. Yeah, you are you are definitely one of my favorite guests I ever get to have. Every time you come on, I end up just having a mind blow moment on the air while you're talking. I don't know if you notice, but I, I'll end up playing that episode over and over and over. Uh, all, all your guest appearance. The first time was, uh, if, if the uh, listeners don't recall, first time was Alpha God. Uh, that was Hector's first book. And then the second one was Sex, Power, and Partisanship. Can you give us like a, a real quick brief summary of what those are, just in case anybody wants to catch up on your earlier work? Yeah, sure. Well, first, I'm, 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 I'm honored that I can stimulate thought. I mean, that's, that's kind of the whole point for me, for writing anyway. But um, so Alpha God takes a look at why the gods we have. You know, not not why God, but why why do gods across the pantheon of, of gods across the world's religions have such an interest in territory, have such an interest in submission displays, have such an interest in our sexual behaviors? What I outline is it's it's, it's about us. It's about our evolved imperatives for survival and reproduction, how we project that into the ether, and how that plays out in terms of religious doctrine, but especially religious violence and oppression, religious wars, religious conquests, you know, sexual restriction, things of that nature. Sex, power, and partisanship 
I wrote this in the wake of the 2016 election, personally as a, as a means to explain why Donald Trump, what, what gave us a Donald Trump presidency? I mean, it's in so many ways so irrational, and it comes from places that are, that are very uh, ancient and primitive and emotion-driven, so I wanted to explain that. So the, the book takes a look at where political partisanship comes from ultimately, and I make the argument that it comes from our our drives to compete for survival and, and reproduction. And that's that's why our political behaviors can be so heated and seem so irrational and seem so like they're driven by this runaway horse sometimes in the media and in our in our public conversations. I could talk about these two books for the entire episode and and I believe me I want to, but you've got a new TED talk coming up. I want to ask you some questions about that. This will be your second TED Talk. Your first one, let me play a quick clip from that. And when there is conflict, we, especially in the United States, now have the technology to put our warriors through advanced training, drop them into fight anywhere on the globe. And when they're done, jet them back to peacetime suburbia. But just imagine for a moment what this must feel like. I have spoken with veterans who told me that one day they're in a brutal firefight in Afghanistan where they saw carnage and death and just three days later, they found themselves toting an ice chest to their kid's soccer game. Mindfuck is the most common term. <laughs> it's the most common term I've heard to describe that experience. And that's exactly what that is. Because while our warriors spent countless hours training for war, we've only recently come to understand that many require training on how to return to civilian life. That whole talk just blew me away, man. Funny that you, that you chose that snippet because... <laughs> Me and the and the the producers of Ted and and my speech coach and and all the other people who, who you know had an eye on it just went back and forth about using that term you know mind fuck because it's so guttural and what was funny to me up on stage is that so many people laughed at that even though it was even though the topic was so dark and heavy yeah. and I just thought well that, that that's probably just uh, you know just releasing that anxious tension based on what I was yes, talking about but so. that kind of caught me by surprise how that term made people laugh yeah it's, it's got to be a release attention 100 percent. there's an awkwardness about this topic i think that that makes us all feel i don't know if guilty is the right word but at least complicit with what these guys are going through and how we're not preparing them for when they return yeah i spend so much time talking about things like war and rape and other kinds of, of dark topics. I sometimes forget how that's not usually a part of public conversation. Right. <laughs> so I talk about it so casually sometimes that even even just telling people what I do, I sometimes get a response like, "Wow, really? You you actually write books about this stuff?" But yeah, I think I think there's some some value to looking at the worst of humanity to try and improve it. Can we circle back to PTSD? Because I I got a lot of questions I want to ask you about that. But you've got a TED talk coming up that it touches on some of that stuff, if I understand. But it also asks the question: Why we go to war? Is that correct? That's correct. Like I, my, I'm I'm very interested in in the ultimate reasons why we go to war. And um, as you and I have talked before offline, there's all kinds of academic disciplines that attempt to answer that question. Right? Poli there's political theory about why we go to war. There's economic theory why we go to war. Rational choice theory, things like that. But Again, what I, I really love um, as, a, as a means of explanation are the evolutionary sciences because they just cut to the most basic, ultimate reasons why we do things. And often, uh, you know, those behaviors that seem so irrational on the face of it and confusing, they make sense of those behaviors. And, and then when you, when you understand the ultimate reasons why we go to war, it's like, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, it's often like, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. So I, I take an evolutionary look at, at that question. So this doesn't necessarily engage in game theory and stuff like that. This, this more or less follows the same thread of thought that your other books did that was on evolutionary psychology and trying to answer some of these nearly impossible to answer questions. Uh, I, I, know, I know in my classes for political science, it, every single time we go through one of the political explanations, as, as you described it, we'll explore that. And I'm like, okay, now I know. And then the professor's like, and here's a book or a, a journal you know, or, or an article that proves that one wrong. But let's look at this one. And then we do that one. Well, this one proves that one wrong. And it's almost, it's almost like this can't be just explained from some quantitative research. We've got to look deeper into our brains. Well, perhaps in a way, I think I think quantitative research 
can help us look deep into our brains. Mm. But I guess I guess through through an evolutionary lens, for me, that's that usually has the, the most explanatory power for why the why we do what we do, the why, not just the how, but the why, the evolved purpose. And you know, when you think about it, life is essentially a a competitive process from the smallest units of life, even even the ways that smaller units of life cooperate with another, it's all, often in the service of competition. Coming forward to, to human beings, I mean, I, I, asked, I asked the same question that I ask in Alpha God. I mean, what is, what is the common predictor to, to warfare? It, it's, it's a demographic, and that demographic is, is men. <clears throat> and this is not to fault men in any way, in a, in, a, in a pejorative way, or say in any way that all men are violent or evil. But war is, a, is by and large a male enterprise, and, it, and it's always been. Um, so where does that come from? Why do men engage in, 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 in warfare? And I think there are answers in the, in the natural world that, that offer some pretty stunning insights. I mean, other male primates, for example, uh, engage in violent competition, and it's usually for mates. Uh, like we talked about, you know, men, male animals uh, often compete for the right to reproduce. And so, for example, uh, baboons. Baboons keep what are called harems. Uh, in, in primatology terms, they, they're aptly called harems because, uh, you know, a dominant <clears throat> baboon will have access to a large group of females. How does, how does that, that animal uh, maintain that access? By attacking his rivals, vicious attacks. I mean, these guys have five-inch canines, bigger than a, a lion's canine, and they chase each other, and there's bloodletting, there's attacks. Male uh, gorillas score off to fight for sexual supremacy. Male chimpanzees and that's the interesting part when you start to look at, at chimpanzees, our closest relatives. Chimpanzees will fight each other in, in this, this manner that really mimics organized warfare of, 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 of humans. I mean, if you've ever seen those clips on, on YouTube or National Geographic or where they come out of, of uh, chimpanzees preparing for patrols, it's, it's eerie, man. They all walk single file patrolling the edges of their territory. It reminds me of men patrolling in the jungles of Vietnam. It's, it's, it's eerily familiar. So if they find a smaller party, they attack that party. If there's numerical supremacy, they will attack that party and, you know, stomp, bite, drag, you know, whatever they have to do to kill the males of uh, their rival males of that party. Well, enough successful patrols, all males from the rival troop are killed and the victors will take over that troop's territory and have access to fruit trees, colobus monkeys, but critically, the females that were once a part of that troop. So as I mentioned in the talk, you know, male chimpanzees have a reproductive incentive for making war. And when we look at the history of human warfare, so do men. This is from uh, Laura Schoberg's uh, Gendering Global Conflict Toward a Feminist Theory of War. I really struggled with war perspective uh, from feminism. And, and maybe I didn't get it, Doc, but... A lot of it kind of pissed me off. I, mean, <laughs> I just thought like it was just like like exactly what you had said just a moment ago where you said, hey, I'm not just saying like men suck. You know, I'm just trying to explain this. But I felt like like this book kind of did say men suck. Let me let me read you something here. Here it is. Um, this is uh, beginning of chapter six, page 157. Women who lead or look to lead are treated differently by their male colleagues on the basis of assumptions about their sex and its relation to the gendered characteristics leaders are expected to portray. Much scholarship on the roles of people and or their choices in war treats a leader as masculine but sexless or necessarily male, and great men are often the heroes of modern war stories. These gendered traits form the ideal typical leader, male in appearance and gender, and masculine in character traits. Discussions of leaders' roles in war making often emphasize the advantages of characteristics associated with masculinity, particularly bravery, chivalry, rationality, and strength, over characteristics associated with femininity, particularly restraint, emotional identification, cooperation, and passivity. So I literally this I was preparing for one of my tests and I literally wrote the words WTF question mark after that paragraph. Because while I understand the concept of saying you know, men are more aggressive, women are more passive. I feel like, well, of course, that's what works in war. We're not talking about uh, an area where a woman would clearly be better than a man in, just based on their sex or their hormone differences, you know. We're talking about an area where men would naturally be better. So I, 
help me understand this. Like, am I am I just taking a a defensive role here, and I'm not able to get the main point? I, I I'm not sure. I I think based on the little snippet that you read, I I don't disagree with that. You know, and there's there's research showing that when women take leadership positions and they're surrounded by male peers, they often have to be extra hawkish, in, you know, in their in their you know, foreign policy stances and, and things of that nature, because they're joining a male dominance hierarchy. And there are rules, the male dominance hierarchy, you have to prove yourself, you know, you have to prove your your strength to gain the respect of your peers, because those uh, certain strengths have utility out on the battlefield. Now, the interesting thing is when the ratio of women in government increases, and women are, are surrounded more by their same sex peers, that tends to go away. But we, we can certainly see examples of, 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 of women who are surrounded by male peers and are extra hawkish, Margaret Thatcher, Hillary Clinton, you know, there are, there are others. So I, I think, yeah, I think there's a certain truth to that. And, and do women try to project masculinity when they're, they're joining, uh, you know, a male fraternity? Yeah, probably. For sure. And even if they're anti-war, like, like a candidate uh, currently like Tulsi Gabbard, they still have to be somebody that served in war and they got to post, you know, Instagram videos of themselves, you know, kicking the shit out of a, a bag for kickboxing. You know what I mean? Like it, it's right. constantly this I have to compete in a man's world kind of perspective for anybody running for public office or combat leadership. Right. Like we evolved in environments much different than the ones in which we currently live. And that's kind of a you know, a basic uh, understanding of evolutionary uh, psychology. Notably, those environments were very dangerous. Warfare was incredibly common. And we can deduce this from the archaeological record. We can, we can look at contemporary hunter-gatherers where in some hunter-gatherer societies, 30, 40, 50 percent of men in those societies are killed uh, at the hands of, of homicide and, and intertribal violence. I mean, that's a, that's a coin toss. You know, we we develop certain preferences and leaders based on that history. You know, the question is, does that still serve us today? And what I focus on a lot in my talk and, and in my writing too is is how mate competition really forms the basis for warfare. I mean, hunter gatherers, for example, it's not uncommon for uh, tribesmen to, to conduct raids on the neighboring tribe kill as many men as they can and and capture women to take home as their wives. Um, and we see this over and over and over in conflicts where wartime rape is staggeringly common. For example, during World War II, when the Red Army invaded Berlin, they raped two million German women, wow. two million German women. So the prevalence of wartime rape is just mind-bogglingly common, much as we would suspect if at the heart of male violence was was competition for females just like any other species there's there's really not a convincing reason to suggest that tendency it's so prevalent across the animal world somehow bypassed men does that mean that all all men who who join the military have the intention to rape or to pillage or to plunder it it doesn't but as i talk about in in this upcoming TED talk is the, the ease with which wartime rape occurs says something about about where we come from. Would it be crazy to say that all men have the intention to rape, pillage, and plunder? And simply, whenever you know, I'm, the male listener right now is going, what, I don't want to rape? You want to rape people, Robert? But that's not my point. My point is the part of us that isn't wanting to rape is the unnatural part. That's the part that we have designed through using the altruism of our evolution, through using the empathy from our past to make a society where we're not doing that. But isn't that... Isn't that our natural state? Oh, I, I don't know if I would characterize it quite quite that. Oh, simply because people vary, uh, men especially vary in terms of their, you know, how, how ready they are to do that in, in certain circumstances. You know, and there is evidence to suggest that that men do vary on, on, on that, whatever underlying, you know, personality traits crossed with the right environmental circumstances lead to rape. You know, um, there are many men in war who, given the temptations, won't do it. But it certainly is one strategy um, for acquiring mates that has perpetuated across the centuries. I mean, we, we look at we look at archaeological finds um, where among all the 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 remains suggesting that a, that a massacre happened, you know, the, the blunt trauma injuries, the broken bones, the embedded spear points, notably absent from from those remains 
are reproductive aged females. Well, you know, what, what happened to those, those women? Were they, not, were they killed? It doesn't seem so. It seems like they were taken captive. So that's a strategy that, you know, we can compare to, to other animals and say, look, this may drive a lot, of, a lot of violence across the world. You know, another example, which I think is fascinating and, and interfaces with religious studies is in societies where polygyny is allowed, you see more revolutions. And what are revolutions? Well, it's, it's young men rebelling against the male dominance hierarchy, the established male dominance hierarchy that, that controls, you know, resources and women. So in other words, when there are women shortages, young men instinctively start reverting back to their roots and they start getting, start getting organizing and getting violent. And that tells you something. And that, that, that makes us, you know, really question perhaps to a, to a, to a greater extent, you know, the morality of, of religious or political doctrines that allow polygyny. Are you saying polygamy? So polygyny. Polygyny, polygyny. is where a cultural system in which one man can have access to multiple wives, okay. usually exclusive access. So what we found is that societies where polygyny is prevalent, where polygyny is allowed, there's a greater frequency of revolutions. Hmm. And what are revolutions? Well, it's, it's young men fighting the established primate dominance hierarchy. They're, they're, they're organizing to make war against men who control power and, and resources and what those resources often attract from time immemorial, you know, um, it's attracted females. And sometimes by choice, sometimes it's, it's forced polygyny. The bottom line is, you know, there are some really ancient instincts that um, uh, bubble up in the form of, of violent conflict that most of us aren't terribly aware of. I don't, and, and a lot of political theorists aren't terribly aware of them. You know, I've heard that most of us have Mongol DNA in us because of all the rape that was going on. Is there, is there some validity to that, that they were just just raping so many people that even now in 2020, a large percentage of the current population has Mongol DNA? A stunning amount. <laughs> and I think, I think mostly people from that region, but there, are, there were genomic studies find, you know, linking back to Genghis Khan and his hordes because that's, that, was, that was the enterprise of, of the Mongol conquest. You know? In fact, do you, you remember Conan the Barbarian? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you, remember what he said, what, what, do you remember what he said when he was asked Conan, what is the meaning of life? Do you remember what he said? Hold on, hold on. Let me see if I can do this one. Um, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Don't, don't say it. Um, uh, something your enemies... Conquer your enemy yes. before you. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, and have them, uh, oh, and hear the lamentation of their women. Something like that, right? <clears throat> yeah. So <laughs> so do you know where they got that? That was, so that was actually that a, that. a saying from Genghis Khan. No way. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's terrifying. <laughs> and it's awesome, too. But it's, it's terrifying because that, you know, and, uh, you know, Genghis Khan at, at that point in history, you know, was control of the largest landmass, the largest territory ever in contiguous territory in ever in recorded history. And it was, what was driving that? It was driving that was, was the male mate competition. Conquer your enemy and, and, and rape his women. Hold on, I found it. I'm going to play it real quick. This is good, but what is best in life? The open step, free thoughts, falcons at your wrist, and the wind in your hair. Wrong! Conan! What is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of your women. Yes! I love it. You know, Genghis Khan just torched Europe, Asia, and North Africa, just torched it, and had, the, had the, the largest contiguous territory ever in human history. And so, so what he said, I actually cite this in both of my books, I think it's so telling. He said, happiness lies in conquering your enemies and driving them in front of you, taking their property, and savoring their despair and raping their wives and daughters. That was, so, so that just, you know, really underscores how in this particular conquest, and I think in, in many conquests, you know, it's mate competition that's ultimately driving men uh, to do these things. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's not often conscious, but sometimes it's very conscious. I mean, just think of the behaviors of uh, ISIS and Boko Haram. That's precisely what they do. Intentionally uh, go to their rivals, kill all the men, kill the boys, and, and kidnap their, their women and use them as, as sex slaves, for example. It's really dark, you know. But again, if we don't have the courage to look at the darkest sides of humanity, you know, I, I think we're less equipped to, to, to change them. So, Doc, what would you say does make us want to go to war? Is it, is it just resource-based in the end? That's a great question. Um, I think ultimately, yes. And even if there are other stated reasons, ultimately, yes. 
I mean, we, we have to remember that um, for most of our human history, we lived hand to mouth. You know, survival was uncertain, tenuous. Starvation was not terribly uncommon. And, you know, when we were hunter gatherers, oftentimes, you know, we were engaging in zero sum competition for resources. So in other words, my loss uh, is your gain and vice versa. And we were, we were, you know, more vulnerable to things like droughts and seasonal migrations, you know, are kind of at the mercy of nature. And we can tell from looking at the archaeological record that, you know, periods of starvation and drought was when conflict tend to, tended to increase. So in those kinds of environments, in those kinds of situations, it, it, it really benefited us to turn inward to the tribe, make raids on our neighbors. You know, raiding was, was a profession for so many thousands of years. But what we have to realize is, you know, now we don't have to compete for resources in the same way. You know, nature in many ways is at our mercy. And we have the power to literally the technology to erase starvation from the human experience. But, you know, we, we still house these Stone Age brains that, you know, may or may not understand that at the unconscious level. What you're talking about seems to, it seems a lot like a prisoner's dilemma. And I'm sure you're familiar, but in case the listener's not. So Hector and I, we get, uh, we get arrested. And Hector had, what kind of drug did you have, Hector? Oh, <laughs> let's say cannabis. <laughs> what was it? Let's say cannabis. All right. And he, Texas, the cannabis, is, as you know, it's not legal here. So he, he, we'll say a, if we say we get arrested in Texas. Yeah, we, he had a big old stack of green sitting on the on the dashboard. Uh, they take us both in. They say, was it your weed or not, right? And they tell Hector, Robert's already tattling on you. And they tell me Hector's already tattling on you. Most of my listeners have been in this situation before, Hector. <laughs> but the best thing for you to do is to uh, rat out your partner and have them not rat you out. If both of you rat each other out, that's the worst case scenario. If both of you don't rat each other out, that's the best case scenario for both of you, kind of, but not for you, because you still get in trouble for it. Regardless, you didn't get freed because you ratted the other person out. So in the prisoner dilemma, even though we all know like we're, we're supposed to not tell on each other, right? That, that snitches, snitches get stitches. But the best thing for you to do is to have your partner believe in you that you won't rat them out and then double cross them, betray them. That sounds a lot like how you perceive what causes war. But one thing I, I, I remember, um, I think it was Hobbes. Was it Hobbes or Hume? Oh, I think it was Hume. But he had said, uh, he had presented the stag theory. Stag theory is you and I, and let's say, you know, a couple other guys, we're looking for the best stag we can find, and we see one, and we're all going to go chase after it. Now, I see a rabbit coming out of the woods. I can go get that rabbit. I can attack it, and I eat. But the rest of you guys don't eat because you needed my help with the stag. We were going to do it as a team. We can't just do it by ourselves, you know? That's kind of his presentation of why war isn't rational. War, war doesn't make sense because we are aware that if we work together, if we find some kind of bargaining method, if we find out, discover some kind of strategy where we all get along, democratic peace theory, what have you, that war should just never happen. Yeah. And, and that, that was Rousseau, but, but, oh, but Rousseau. yeah, it, it, it is, it is, it does seem irrational in the modern day. Right. It does seem irrational. I mean, we re really don't have to compete for survival in the same way that we once did because we've mastered food production across the world. Maybe not everywhere across the globe, but like, you know, how many tons of, of food go wasted every year? How many tons of grain? How many how much how how easy would it be to feed the whole world? You know, it would be within our grasp. I would think so. so yeah. I would think so, too. I mean, if, if we just tax the riches. I, I saw the funniest thing on the internet the other day where it said uh, there's a magic box. It's got a button on top. If you push it, all the starving people in the world get something to eat, but all the uh, billionaires lose a little bit of their money. Would you push the button? <laughs> I thought, well, yeah, who wouldn't push that? But if you actually have that same conversation in politics today, that's socialism. That's going to lead right, to gulags. Right, right. So maybe the extreme right wingers wouldn't push that button. And we talked about some of the reasons why in our prior podcast. But yeah, that could be a thing. <laughs> I certainly would. You know, Hector, in, in reference to PTSD, I read Tribe by Sebastian Younger. It blew me away, man. Uh, hey, let me read you a quote from his book here. Humans don't mind hardship. In fact, they thrive on it. What they mind is not feeling necessary. Modern society has perfected the art of making people not feel necessary. 
And I'm wondering, is that part of what happens not just to soldiers that come back and they don't have the same kind of significant meaning that they had over there? That was life and death, right? Everybody's counting on each other. Uh, You get rewarded or at least acknowledged for what you're doing. And they come back here and just nothing's happening. Is it fair to say that's how civilians live every day? Like, oh like, gosh, just matter. just think about it. You're you're a, a 20 year old kid in charge of the lives of of you know how many men, depending on on how high you are on the uh, on the hierarchy, in charge of their lives. You're in charge of millions of dollars worth of equipment. Everything you do has life or death consequences every day. And you come back, and nothing nothing has such a profound sense of urgency. But but not only that, what Sebastian talks about in Tribe is, you know, the connection you have with other people. So, you know, you you get this daily reassurance from other people, from other men, that they're going to put themselves on the line for you. They're going to put their lives on the line for you. Every day they prove that to you and you prove it to them. And you come back and nobody is making that same guarantee. And And, you know, by comparison, it's like this world is not only vapid and boring, but how can I trust every anybody because they're not they're not showing me that they're not giving me that guarantee. It's 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 really part of reintegration that's that's very striking and hard to hard to adapt to. Did you see that movie Three Hundred? I did. With all the oiled up, perfectly chiseled six packs fighting each other. <laughs> yeah, I did. I honestly, it's a joke. The wife laughs at me anytime I watch it, but I love that movie. I yeah. love. It. I thought it was fucking cool, man. But anyway, I was I was. Looking into it, the the actual validity behind the the Persian and Athenian battles, uh, Epizelus was actually an Athenian soldier that Heroditus wrote about. Apparently, just from and he wasn't even in the actual combat. He was a soldier. Uh, he was in the war. Nothing happened to him. He wasn't injured, but he did see the combat. And uh, according to history, he he ended up going blind from it. This kind of led me through, uh, you know, like one of those just internet spirals right where i'm like what who else who else in history have we recorded with some of these potential ptsd symptoms achilles from Mm -hmm. the iliad Uh, homer wrote about how he just couldn't find any sleep um gaius uh marius from Mm -hmm. rome i was a roman general had constant night terrors after the wars uh even in shakespeare it references um uh, lady percy is talking to harry about how he's he's just constantly sweating He's freaking out all the time. He doesn't want to go to bed with her. He can't sleep. Uh, she she describes his white face, how he's always looking at the floor, how it, all, all night he's having these nightmares. Is this likely a record of PTSD throughout time? And, it, and, and even if these stories aren't true, at least it seems like we've always kind of known about it, uh, whether we called it shell shock or um, what were some of the other ones? We had so many versions, you know? Yeah, look, so so that's a great point. You know, that's a great observation. And there's even a book out there, a really cool book called Achilles in Vietnam that that looks at at, at all the warriors in, in Homer's, you know, epic poems and says, hey, this this sounds a lot like PTSD. There is a really fascinating and convincing area of study called evolutionary psychopathology that that says, you know, basically that a lot of what we regard as as psychopathology really has its roots in adaptation, you know? So, so for instance, we have a far greater tendency to develop phobias of things like spiders or snakes or heights uh, than we do things that really could kill us in, in the modern day far more easily, like crossing the street, you know? Because the, having a fear of those things benefited us in our evolutionary past where those dangers were very prevalent. So the same the same is true for PTSD, and I think I think the nature of PTSD really reflects a very um, you know a very fraught, very dangerous history, human history, where warfare was very common. And I think it's important for people to understand this because so many of my patients, who I, I work mostly with veterans and almost exclusively with men, but so many of my patients come into therapy thinking that they're failing for having PTSD. It's a failure. You know, or they don't get treatment because they think it's a failure. They feel ashamed, ashamed about it. You know, and, and part of that is 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 military culture, right? Where where toughness, mental toughness, is required to perform arguably one of the the hardest jobs a human being can have. And you know, as as a warrior, to go out and risk death every day and to take lives every day. You know, but on the flip side of that, I think it it prevents people from getting treatment and and misses the 
evolved utility of PTSD. So if I make, I'd like to unpackage some of the, the symptoms of PTSD just to explain what I'm talking about. Yeah, please do. A couple of the symptoms. So there's this evolutionary psychiatrist named Chris Cantor who, who, who really um, is the person who, who wrote the book on the, the, the evolved psychology of PTSD. So some of what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about you know, taps into his work. But the idea that the symptom cluster that we call re-experiencing. So when, when you have PTSD, you usually re-experience the trauma in different ways. Memories, nightmares, or you see something that reminds you and that brings it back. But it's not a pleasant experience. Right? The adrenaline goes way up. The emotions are very intense and painful. Well, that is, is no question that that is disturbing to the individual experiencing it. But what Cantor asks is like never forgetting something that was, that was very dangerous. You know, would that serve somebody? You know, would, that, would that benefit our survival somehow? And, and you know, it's pretty face valid. I mean, if, if I almost get mauled by a cave bear walking in front of a certain cave at a certain part of the woods, it really benefits me to always remember that cave and what happened to me so that I don't aimlessly walk in front of that cave again. Right. <laughs> Does that make sense? That makes good sense. And then, and then, you know, we have hypervigilance, you know, being more vigilant than you need to, watching your surroundings, looking for danger, you know. So if I'm hypervigilant, I got my back against the door or against the wall at a restaurant, watching people coming in, watching the door, sizing people up, going through tactical scenarios in my head. You know, who's going to attack me? And if they do, what will I do? You know, that benefits you in a dangerous environment such as combat. You know, it just doesn't benefit you today. In a dangerous environment like our ancestral past, that benefits you. Man, if, if I put you out on the African savanna and give you a spear and say, good luck, go walk around there and make a living for yourself, you're going to be w- paying attention to every noise you hear in the bushes because it could potentially be, you know, a predator way stronger, way faster, way more vicious than you that could eat your entrails in a matter of seconds, you know, it benefits you. It just doesn't benefit us now, you know, at a, at Starbucks or at a, a, you know, at a restaurant getting angry very quickly that benefits us in a war zone, right? If somebody, if somebody fires at you, you want to fire, you want to return fire immediately full on to the death without any questions today, right now, you don't want to pause that benefits you. It doesn't benefit you in the modern day, you know, it, 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 it makes you estranged from family members. It makes it hard to keep, hold down a job. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but the, but the point is, you know, what benefits us in our ancestral past may not be totally adaptive in the kinds of environments we live in now, like we've talked about with other things. I recently read that uh, most people that have PTSD haven't even, or aren't even in the military. Most PTSD cases are with civilians themselves. Is that true? <sighs> Well, I'm not. I'm not sure what the latest base rates are, you know, between civilian and, and military populations. But I, it's certainly, you know, I think I think it's it's most definitely not restricted to military related traumas. I mean, it can be it can be any kind of trauma. I wonder if that's and, if that's just because you know most people aren't in the military. You know, like the like the stats of uh, uh, the number of people in the military to the number of people not in the military. Of course. You know, every mental illness would be higher in people not in the military, you know, just because of the it's a lower percentage. But maybe it's being in the military increases the probability of having PTSD more than a civilian. Maybe that would be a better way to characterize it. Well, you know, in in nations that aren't at war, you're probably way more likely to get to experience a trauma in a motor vehicle accident, you know, something like that or or get assaulted or get raped or something of that nature, all of which is is considered a trauma, you know, in terms of the uh you know the the diagnostic criteria that we use to to uh, arrive at a PTSD diagnosis, but but you're right. I mean, it can be a, it can be a number of things. Seeing somebody get hurt, to getting assaulted, being in a natural you know experiencing a natural disaster, and it's important to differentiate what is what is. Some people say, well, I have PTSD because I flunked out of grad school. I mean, that's traumatic in the vernacular sense, but not really going to get PTSD from it, or a divorce, or something like that, or getting fired from your job, you know. But certainly, you can, or child abuse, you can you can develop PTSD as a, as a result of having experienced, you know, trauma or abuse as a child. So PTSD from academic failing or from marital issues, financial problems, you would say that that likely isn't a correct diagnosis, that that would be more more likely something other than PTSD? Well, yeah, something other than PTSD. There's no question that those kinds of things cause distress, mm-hmm. a great deal of distress. But, you know, usually the trauma, uh, the kinds of trauma that lead to developing PTSD 
are, are usually a threat to your safety, to your physical safety or your physical integrity. What would you recommend for someone that does have PTSD or just could use some some methods in trying to deal with it? Is there anything in our closing that you would say uh, might be a good idea for them to try to practice or exercise? Let me tell you, that's a, that is an important question. That's an important question. And, you know, just like medications have been through research trials, you know, anything that you can get at the grocery store, NyQuil, Tylenol, it's, it's been through clinical trials to make sure that the compound does what it says it's supposed to do. But I think a lot of people don't know that non-medication treatments have been through similar trials. And in the case of PTSD, we've studied what works and what doesn't work for about the past 40 years. What we found is that most of the talk therapies that are unstructured, where you just come in and rap with somebody, you know, tell me about your day. It's just kind of, you know, patient led and, and exploratory, incredibly useful for a wide variety of things. You're going to learn about yourself, but in the end, your PTSD is not going to go away. What does work are training oriented treatments like cognitive processing therapy, a therapy that helps you look at thought patterns that may have changed since your trauma, thought patterns that may be related to the old environment and not adaptive for the current environment, or prolonged exposure therapy, treatments that help you through repeated exposure to things that make you anxious in a safe environment and a safe context, and, and it helps you to kind of rewire your adrenal system you're, you're, so you don't, you don't respond with a big adrenaline rush every time you see a trigger. Those treatments are incredibly effective. I've been doing these full-time for the past 15 years, and I can tell you they work. But it's important that you ask for them by name. And if you're not doing the intensive training-based methodical exercises that those two treatments embody, you're not getting the best care. What about psychedelics? I've heard um, you know, DMT, ayahuasca, uh, psilocybin, MDMA, these kind of things are being used for PTSD. Is that is that accurate or am I hearing some wacky stuff? Uh, there's an organization called MAPS that has really lobbied for studying psychedelics in clinical research because um, a lot of these, these uh, things like psilocybin or mescaline or LSD or MDMA where have been put on schedule one, the most restrictive category for any kind of substance without exploring their clinical utility. And so they've really lobbied for, hey, we, we really have to study some of these things and see if, see if, they, if they have any, any psychotherapeutic value. So we don't know. I mean, there are some very interesting trials coming out. And I, 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 don't, I don't think that psilocybin is going to make PTSD go away or, or DMT or anything like that. I think speaking from personal experiences, I think these compounds can have a profound effect on how you see the world and your place within it. Uh, I've done ayahuasca and it's had that experience with me. I was in the Native American church for 20 years where I uh, used the peyote ritualistically and it really does change how you see things, but it's not going to make PTSD go away. For that, I really think you need the treatments that I just described. Okay. I did not expect to hear that you did ayahuasca. I'm going to be honest with you. What's it like, yeah. man? Well, I I got doctored by a couple a couple native dudes that I know because I think we we may or may have not have talked about this in previous podcasts I can't remember I don't but think we did um, we've talked about we've talked about a lot of I think we've talked about psychedelics before but I don't think we talked about your experience. Well, the short version <laughs> is that ethnically I'm what's known as mestizo, which means you know part Spanish, part native. And I had um, really kind of explored the native side of my heritage through a quasi-religion Native American church, which, uh, man, maybe we can talk about that one day in, in detail. But it's used as a vehicle for, for almost like, like an eight-hour psychotherapy ritual in this, in this so-called church. And as part of that, I, I, you know, I got to know a lot of Native people. And, and one time I, I did get doctored with, uh, with ayahuasca. It is intense. It is incredibly intense. Um, it changes your perspective on uh, what it means to be alive, what it means to have consciousness. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a, a very common uh, experience um, with ayahuasca. And, and in, in that respect, you know, it has a lasting effect on how people see the world. And some of it just goes beyond your ability to explain with words, and that's that's been my experience as well. It's 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 really intense. Wow. Do, do you see a lot of uh, geometric patterns and that sort of thing, or is it like in the movies where you're seeing, you know, the the great animal spirit? 
Oh, yeah. you see a lot with that. It's very visual. Yeah, you see a lot of geometric patterns, and you see things. You know, everybody sees and experiences different things at the same time. There's commonalities, but you probably see things germane to your own own psychology. It's not an easy way at arriving at insight. Let me tell you, it's 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 intense. You, you know, you kind of uh, cut your moorings loose and drift out to see. <laughs> You know, you ever wonder if that's where some of our religions come from? Like I, I've heard that uh, the burning bush, maybe was some kind of a psychedelic because he sees God right after. It could be. I mean, we've been using psychedelics for a long time, at least at least in terms of uh, the Native American church. I mean, there's there's evidence to suggest it's you know peyote has been used as a as a sacrament for at least five, six, seven thousand years, way before you know the emergence of the the Christ figure. I don't know how much of that kind of stuff was available in, in the biblical Middle East in the Fertile Crescent, but sure, perhaps. I had this buddy of mine, he was in uh, Vietnam, and he said that whenever they would uh, start to go into battle, that their superior officer would require all of them to get, quote-unquote, B-12 shots. And he mm-hmm. said, Robert, I got to tell you, man, if I could get a hold of one of those B-12 shots today, <laughs> he says I would give anything more. He said, because I'll be damned if that was B-12. Uh, I don't know if it was some kind of cocaine or just straight adrenochrome or some kind of crazy rush or something that, that, that I was given, but uh, he said they would all just get wild. The, the, whole, oh, troop would just, the whole team would just get crazy, and uh, uh, if they didn't have somebody to fight, they'd end up fighting each other. That scared the hell out of me. You know, here we are talking about treatment options for soldiers after war, but I kind of I wonder what they're given in war or maybe that stuff doesn't go on anymore but even the thought that it did that's just terrifying i could not imagine being in a in in a combat theater high on anything you know especially i mean i've heard stories of people doing psychedelics like like you know in a firefight i I just couldn't imagine a greater terror and a liability i mean you want all your senses you want you want to be sharp no kidding well, I, I don't know that it was the way he described it. It wasn't a psychedelic. It'd be it'd be closer to some kind of methamphetamine, is is what he was trying to say. But it's, oh yeah, it's well crazy. you know yeah, the Nazis experimented with that kind of stuff too. You know, really, like they yeah. they gave it, they gave meth to Nazis. Mm-hmm. I had mm-hmm. never heard that. That's wild. I'm sure they're not the only ones to 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 use you know um, stimulants in in the context of war. Dr. Garcia, I love talking to you every time. It means a lot to me to have you have you come back on the show again. Where can people find this TED Talk? Uh, what's it called? Uh, what kind of uh, video outlets would you recommend they, they view it on? Also, if you guys just scroll down to the bottom of the uh, podcast outlet that you're listening to this on right now, you'll find this link in today's show notes. I'll put it on my website, hector-garcia.com. It'll be on YouTube. And, um, you know, hopefully it will be the contribution that I, that I wish it to be. Dr. Garcia, thanks for what you're doing. And uh, thanks for uh, giving us a snippet of what you're working on right now today hey man i enjoy talking with you we can we, we can geek out all day about all kinds of things i mean <laughs> we kind of go from topic to topic because there's so much interesting stuff to talk about in the world and, and you seem to, to to have a lot of interest worth discussing too so it's, it's good enjoy it yeah thank you to hector thank you to dave at dave blair Music. Um, thank you to our patrons. You can support this broadcast at patreon.com forward slash right and learn more at the right to reason.com. Next week, I'll be debating a Christian apologist that says he has touched Jesus Christ and now has the power to heal people. Between now and then, remember that you have the right to reason. Reason.